Grave Fencer Musashi. Let's do it! 20 years ago, I had a chance to play a game which was challenging my young boy brain. It was a fun action platformer RPG. I never had the chance to finish it, but this time, I finally got to it, and I can truly say, this game is old, but gold. Brave Fencer Musashi is an action platformer RPG developed by Squaresoft in 1998 for the PlayStation 1. Now, the game story revolves around our namesake hero Musashi, who has to save the All You Can Eat Kingdom from the Thirst Quencher Empire. Sprite, Thirst to Quench. Now, the game delivers a good mix of real time combat and a not so tight platforming with a dash of puzzles that can range from simple to, bro, do I have to Google this? Which was prolific around that time period for RPG games. Squaresoft, now called Square Enix, had a stellar year before the release of Brave Fencer Musashi, putting out bangers such as Final Fantasy Tactics, Saga Frontier, Chocobo's Mysterious Dungeon, Front Mission 2, and the breakout star of 1997, Final Fantasy 7. Coming off the success of Final Fantasy VII, you can tell that Square wanted to push out another original banger with Brave Fencer Musashi. A clear influence of Final Fantasy VII has to be those giant anchor arms. Jokes aside, players were eating well in the golden era of RPGs in the 90s. Our story begins with the all-you-can-eat kingdom under attack by the Thirst Quencher Empire. I think I already mentioned this and yes, it's called All You Can Eat. As a smooth brain child who played this with a sound off back then and didn't understand puns, I just call it Alukini. Stop it. Get some help. The residents of this kingdom, castle, empire, and monarchy, have names that's food related. It kinda reminds me of how Akira Toriyama named the Saiyans in Dragon Ball, and have everyone named after vegetables, but make it food for Brave Fencer Musashi. The anonymous character is then summoned by Princess Filet and ask our hero to retrieve Lumina, the Sword of Luminescence. He is then tasked with defeating the Thirst Quencher Empire, and take a shot every time I mention Thirst Quencher in this video, and bring peace to the land. He is then given the Sword of Fusion to help him with his task in retrieving Lumina. Fun fact, the heroic ray fencer Musashi is based on real-life samurai and philosopher Miyamoto Musashi. What I love the most of what Square did with the design is the emphasis on his dual wielding, showcasing Lumina and Fusion on the cover art. For a game that came out of this era, the voice acting is superb. Oh, he's here! Our gracious hero, Brave Fencer Musashi! Hmm, he's rather small. This will not do. It must have been too large of a task for the princess. If the princess summoneth him, he must not be a credible hero. What do you guys want? Let me go home. I'm busy, you know? You may not become a Jill sandwich or anything, but hearing such conviction in the voices of the characters just adds to the immersion. You're then thrust into the first level of the game. It's a wonderful intro stage where you get to experience the controls, combat, and the power that fusion holds. Assimilation. One of the main things I enjoy about Brave Fencer Musashi is the artwork that's displayed whenever you successfully assimilate an enemy. Think of it like Cell from Dragon Ball, ducking his targets dry. Oh, fuck no. And then getting their powers. Or like Majin Buu, who drags you into himself and gets your powers. You're then shown that you must absorb this soldier creature and use its power, Gunshot, to get past the first obstacle of the game. You then reach the tower which holds Lumina. 
you have to climb up and avoid these rolling wheels. An issue I have with this climb is that the camera is angled in a weird position and can potentially lead you to drop down the bottom of the tower and restart the climb again. Upon successfully completing a set of simple puzzles, you then get a hold of Lumina, the Sword of Luminescence, and just like classic 90s fashion, you have to run down the tower a la Indiana Jones and avoid getting squished by the head that guards Lumina. After getting away, you then reach the castle only to see the princess being kidnapped. You're then introduced to Rutrik, the second lieutenant of the Thirst Quencher Empire. And after being shown how to use Lumina, Rutrik then introduces us to the first boss fight in the game. The entirety of the first chapter of the game is a huge tutorial session, and after defeating the Steam Knight, Musashi falls asleep and then we're trusted into the second chapter. The second chapter has us do small side quests for the village. You're then introduced to the missing 35 members of the All You Can Eat Kingdom and are given a list of people to save. You're then given a hint to save Secret Beverly from the bit show field she's imprisoned in. Illiterate! In my opinion, saving her is not that impacting, mainly because if you know where the bit show fields are, she kinda just becomes another statistic. However, if you haven't played this game and you're first timing it, dropping hints on where the potential members of the kingdom is a huge plus. And she also drops vague hints on what your mission objectives are. In chapter 2, to gain the trust of the village, you're gonna do a few things for them. First, find the guard who allows you to go through the mountains, save the dog, and help the guy in the stocks on the outskirts of the town. You are then tasked to follow his dog through the meandering forest to get the key to the stocks. You're gonna escort Leno and protect him from attacks while he sniffs out the right way towards the graveyard. After successfully getting the key, if you're trying to help him during the day, he will ask you to do it later in the evening so that no one will see you help John. You can use a sleep mechanic to speed up the time and complete the objective there. And did I mention the in-game clock is absolutely good. Being able to track what days and what time works for certain NPCs is a genius idea of making the experience immersive. It gives them a sense of personality and routine. Speaking of personalities, let's talk about the NPCs you meet in Chapter 2. Starting off with Hilda, the grocer. Welcome! Haven't seen you before. I'm Usashi. I'll be hanging around this town for a while. Is that so? Have you met my son, Tim? And what do you need? Hilda will be selling most of the items you need for the adventure, and I have one thing to say. Cheese. Cheese will save your life. Cheese will make your day. Cheese will save the world. Another NPC you'll be interacting with the most will be Hotello, the innkeeper. The inn is where you'll be saving most of the time, and if you're loaded, maybe spend some cash to rush there instead, instead of backtracking to the castle. Jam is the baker's daughter and the second store that sells restorative items, but Hilda's cheese reigns supreme. First, the action figure storekeeper, and then there's the pawn shop. We'll talk about the pawn shop a little later, and lastly, the bar or the restaurant. I'll let you guys be the judge of the dialogue. Oh, you're cute. Is this your first time at a place like this, baby? Uh, that's right. I'm Musashi. Nice to meet you. No, nice to meet you. Have a nice time. FBI, open up! After helping John out of the stocks, you're then given a hint about some treasure you can find. Musashi thinks that John is giving him a hint on where to find the five elemental scrolls. He'll then ask you to gather some logs and climb up the mountain. Then John makes you a raft, so you then do this downstream rafting minigame. Once you find the treasure after completing the minigame, you can then appraise this at the pawn shop. Spread across the kingdom are treasures you can find, and one of these treasures are the legendary armor pieces of the Brave Fencer Musashi. You then get the L brace, which allows you to scale walls with a triangle and square button. And just after getting the L brace, you're now faced with a timed mission. Save the kingdom from destruction by shutting down Steamwood, the kingdom's Binto type refinery. 
This sounds like a lot like a Miku Reactor to me. This is one of the most stress-inducing levels of the game. Brave Fencer Musashi is a great game, but one thing the game has is not-so-stellar platforms. Aside from being a timed event in the game, you have to reset the bulbs found inside another timer, and if you run out, you start back at the beginning. Since the platforming is not so great, and if you're not too careful, you'll have to do it over and over again until you get to the top and save the kingdom. It doesn't help that I almost ran out of time doing this segment of the game. The controls can be a bit of a pain in this section as you are rushing to beat the clock. The elevator you take is also a bit slow, and if you fall down to the bottom of the reactor, then bam. You might run out of time on the valve timer and start all over again. After completing Steamwood, you then head back to Twin Peak Mountain and race Rootrick to the top of the mountain to get the Earth Scroll. One of them five scrolls is just over them there. Can't have you in my way. What? There's a scroll nearby? Ah, shoot! You found it out! I'll get you! After getting the Earth Scroll, you're then informed that to release the scroll, you would have to defeat the scroll's Crest Guardian. A requirement before being able to fight the Crest Guardian is to save four specific NPCs from their Binjo fields. When you inform Ripson that you've saved them, he'll tell you to go to Hell's Valley, fight the boss there, it's here! It's here! Man your post! And you know what? The boss fight is rather one-dimensional. All you have to do is use the Earth Scrolls power to drop bombs and rocks on the Crest Guardian, then damage the core with Boomina. Rinse and repeat until you defeat the boss. A potential reason that'll make the boss fight a bit longer is having your team of NPCs incapacitated for a couple of seconds by the Guardian or get knocked off by the Guardian's tail and be poisoned, hampering your movement. After beating the Guardian, you get a cutscene showing the Thirst Quencher Empire and their forces. You can see that they're named after beverages, hence the Thirst Quencher name. We are then introduced to Bubbles and her plan to destroy the kingdom via Operation Bambi. The third chapter of the game has to be the longest chapter as you'll be doing a lot of backtracking and is a test of patience plus platforming so you better put on your big boy pants because chapter 3 begins with Musashi being informed that Tim, Hilda's son, has been bit by a vampy, a half vampire, half zombie creature. You're then tasked by the mayor to go into the mines and get a Mysteria flower. Going through the mines can be a bit of a pain due to the poison mushrooms and environmental hazards. After getting the Mysteria Flower, which blooms around 3 to 7 a.m., you then have to go back to Twin Peak Mountains and help Hotello secure Aqualin. You meet Hotello near the peak of the mountain, and the man has given up and was ready to let Tim vampify. You're then given another time mission. You must hurry to the top of the mountain to acquire Aqualin. It will be a bit of a pain trying to jump towards the top as you can slip and drop down to the level below and restart your climb. After completing that small platforming section, you acquire Aqualin and give it to Hotello. After returning to the village, you're then informed that Tim has been cured and now you must investigate the origins of the Vambies. Quick side note, you can actually let Tim Vambify and lose the functionality of buying cheese from Hilda's store. But, you know, you get this dialogue here. Uh, you know what? Oh, fuck you, Tim. You gather your clues and you're then informed that Vambies are pouring out of the restaurant. You go inside and find the owner of the restaurant popped up on caffeine. In the Japanese version, it'll say that he's intoxicated or drunk. Fun fact, any references to alcohol in this game is censored by the English version. Bubble's name in the Japanese version is the core, Rutrik is Bordeaux, and Capricola is Colonel Jean Vodka. The restaurant owner will then lead you down a set of stairs to clear four specific rooms to get what's behind the door. This segment of the game can be done in any order, so pick your poison on which rooms you'd like to do. Each of the rooms can be challenging and always be mindful of your HP and of your save frequency. I forgot to save after clearing one of the rooms and didn't use one of the things called memory boxes in the game. They're considered checkpoints. If you used a memory box, let's say two hours ago and you died, you get brought back to it. So always, always, always use the memory box every time you finish one of the rooms in this level so you don't turn out like me who had to stop recording for a day to avoid destroying my controller. 
Each of the rooms have their own set of challenges. One is a room where you have to use the power bowl from these plant monsters that you can absorb and use it to defeat a set of bambies like you're in a bowling alley and avoid being squished by the walls. Another room is a teleporter room and you have to be careful of your choices or you get set back to the start of the level. The easiest room in this stage is where you just have to solve a few puzzles, absorb a ghost power to be able to scout ahead, and clear the room. And last but not the least, the fire pit room. I kind of hate this room. You have to complete a gauntlet of moving platforms, avoid getting hit by sights, and avoid flying vambies. It's pretty straightforward, but the frequency of the sights really can put you in a pinch if you don't have any HP items in your inventory. After destroying each of the crystals that locked the door where the restaurant owner was guarding, you can then go inside and see him regretting his decision of releasing the vambies onto the village. You then get the L-belt and now can double jump. A lot of your platforming problems are solved by this item. You can access a few different areas you weren't able to during the first two chapters. Your next move now is just to go through the church. You're told by the pastor to come back at 2am, you get inside the church and fight Bubbles and her posse of super vambies. Damaging these super vambies doesn't really do anything to them. You can assimilate them too, however, it'll be a bit hard as they'll move towards you in a group of two or three. Musashi then realizes that these Vambies are weak to the sun and just stalls until 7am. Bubble leaves and then you're then tasked with retrieving the church bell by the pastor. You can use the rope that he gives you so you can go down the well. You then see the water scroll, use it to traverse the mines with the bell in tow, and return to the village. Just like how you obtained the earth scroll, you now have to liberate it and face off with his respective crest guardian. You get a statue from the pastor, you go back to the restaurant basement, complete the puzzle, and clear a room, then fight the Crest Guardian. Uh-oh! It's starting to move! <laughs> what a loser! The ceiling's collapsed and he can't move! Deek! <laughs> This fight can be a bit time consuming as you have to charge the water scroll a lot and use his water bullets to deal damage on the flame that the relic keeper sends out. If the flame is bluish white, you have to avoid it. If it's red, just use the water scroll repeatedly until you can hit the core with Lumina. Rinse and repeat. You'll notice this pattern as soon as you get to the other scrolls as well. Chapter 4 is the shortest amongst the chapters. You can now liberate Watercrush you can find. You try talking to the mayor and find out that he's sick and you'll have to be the acting mayor for the meantime. You're then tasked to fix the well. In my playthrough, I actually did the well section first before talking to the mayor and you're treated to a different set of dialogue and also meet two members of the Thirst Quencher Empire's special forces. After that, you're then tasked with fixing the gondola. You'll have to talk to a few NPCs to gather some information on how to fix it. You then venture back into the mines. Now equipped with the L-Belt and the Water Scroll, you have to find the Gondola Wheel. I actually made a mistake during my first run of the Gondola Wheel and had to backtrack to get the right wheel. Wait a sec. Maybe... This is the Gondola Gizmo. After having the Gondola fix, you rest and wake up to the village on fire. Thank god you have the Water Scroll and you just have to turn off the fire using the Water Bullets. You're then given Rock Salt by the Mayor's Wife. This point had me a bit confused as I didn't know what I would do so I talked with the chef and a few NPCs at the castle. What you're supposed to do is use the rock salt at that giant statue that is actually a big ass slug. And it shrinks upon reacting to the rock salt. It's pretty straightforward at this point. Save a castle member, use the water scroll to liberate the water crust, and then obtain the fire scroll right after. You will encounter Musashi's real life rival, Sasaki Kojiro, and he has a princess with him and challenges Musashi to a duel. He's not really a hard boss to deal with, and he's not so smart as well. You can just wail at him with your attacks, and if you're properly leveled up at this point, he is a piece of cake. Once you leave the area, you're back to the castle. At this point of the game, you'll be getting hints from this conversation between Ribson, Filet, and Musashi. Come to think of it, I haven't dealt with the Thirst Quencher losers or those thieves yet. They might try to kidnap her again. You can then talk to three mercenary NPCs if you save them and not skip any venture fields, you'll get clues about the thieves' hideout. 
each mercenary gives you a different set of clues. These are all shogi related. If you figure the puzzle out, you gotta head back to the meandering forest, do a sequence of directions based on the clues, you then find the thieves' hideout. Dumb thieves? Hmm. Ah, you mean leader's force. Do I look like I belong with such scum? My name is Ginger Ale. Isn't it an exquisite name? You run into Bubbles' beloved sister, Ginger Ale. She is a bit of a nonchalant person, but is still a bit rude to Musashi and still manages to diss him. After meeting Ginger Ale, you're free to roam the hideout or castle. Unlike the Relic Keeper's lair, this time you're tasked with collecting three different colored eyes. You have to complete a series of puzzles to get these eyes, including one where you get thrown a red herring by the clue, and actually have to assimilate the clone or copy of Musashi, but it is a bit hard to do as it mirrors your movements and attacks. I got a bit lucky when it came to assimilating the copy. You can also get the L shoes in this area, and it is required to climb the stairs, heading towards the next press guardian. This boss fight was a bit time-consuming because you have to dodge and hit the frost dragon when it is moving towards you. You have to run towards the next area. The second stage of the frost dragon is basically dodge all of its attacks, see it charge a beam, wait for it to tire itself out, then use the fire scroll to inflict damage. Oh yeah, did I mention that the earth scroll and water scroll don't really have any combat applications? So when I got the fire scroll, I was happy that finally I can do some damage with one of the hard-earned scrolls of course. After figuring out the pattern to the madness, which is a frost dragon, you finally defeated it, and now you must head back to the village. The penultimate chapter starts off with you being told by the mayor that the princess has taken the village's profits. You'll then have to investigate, check in with every shopkeeper, or just one if you want to, in the village to verify the claims they made, then head back to Ribson to tell him about what happened. I mean, yo. How does the princess go around without the butler? He's been kidnapped and you don't even keep an eye on her? Fired. Musashi takes the newly fixed gondola and you notice smoke or steam. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't happy having to do steam wood for a second time. Even if you had the L belt and was double jumping around the place, some of the steam placement can make it a bit difficult, but not as hard as the first time you did this minigame. Another thing is that you uncovered that the princess was actually Tapo a member of the leader force. She was about to escape with the village's profits, but forgot about it. After completing Steam Wood a second time, you can then go back into the area where you got the water scroll and enter the room that holds the fire crest. All you have to do now is climb up and grab the wind scroll. The wind scroll allows Musashi to charge up Lumina and spin. It's a spin a wind move, pretty much. You can dig holes underground and use it to go against air currents, and after getting the scroll, you then run into bubbles and ginger ale and get trapped in a binchu field. I mean, yo, you think a binchu field can hold our hero? Ain't no way. You break out of the binchu field and then get back to the village. You're then told that there's trouble near the gondola. A giant. Yes, it's called that giant. No, I did not make this up. You take this thing out by using the gondola from the castle and it then climbs back up to its nest. I'm pretty sure you know what's gonna happen next. You have to go through the entire dungeon and beat the boss there. Once you get down into the nest, you're then given the choice to go left or right. The left side is an HP upgrade, to the right is the way towards the quest. You're then given the chance to use the wind scroll here by going against the current and onto the next area. There's a room here where you also have to use fusion and tap as fast as you can while trying to jump a cliff. The entire giant nest is pretty much the mines but with ants. Do a little platforming here, do a little platforming there, kill some ants using a power you can absorb in fusion called acid, find one of the best farming spots in the entire game, and complete another mandatory mini game before you meet the Crest Guardian. Speaking of Crest Guardians, you now have to throw down against the giant queen. Ooh. Brother, ooh. what's that? Kinda disgusting. How 
I'm doing a favor and slice it to shreds. The queen has a few patterns. She has a grab attack, which does decent damage. She will drop some larva onto her belly and you have to clear it off. She'll pop some spikes out of her torso and you'll have to avoid it by jumping around and a raking move. You'll have to figure out the pattern, wait for her to get tired, and slash her with Lumina until a core pops out of the butt area. You'll have to use the Windstraw's ability here to avoid getting poisoned and damaging the core. Just like the previous bosses, figure out the pattern, get to the core, rinse and repeat, and once you beat the giant queen, you're then shown a wind crest and you liberate it right there. You then wake up right outside the village and get told by John that this guy scroll is now ready to be claimed. Well, actually, I've been looking for scrolls, man. Already have the earth, water, fire, and wind scrolls, pal. Man, then the only one that's left is the sky scroll. So you know where it is? Sure, man. I looked it up in some ancient scriptures. A pillar of wind, day of the sky, tears of God fall on the forest, prodigious tree. He will then give you a few hints on where to find a sky scroll. After a long journey in the all-you-can-eat kingdom, you're about to hit the point of no return. Before getting the sky scroll, this is your chance to backtrack for things that you've missed in the game. To get a perfect ending, you have to beat the game twice, and you will need to have completed the following. Hit level 30, which is the max level of Musashi in this game, catch all 13 Minkus, save all 35 members of the all-you-can-eat kingdom, open all of the chests that can be found in the game, this includes any memory chests, complete the entire action figure collection, where some of the figures are locked behind the first ending of the game so you have to play the final chapter twice to access all of the available toys. Whew, okay, that was a mouthful. After preparing for the final chapter of the game, you can then go to the forest near Steamwood on Sky Day in the morning to activate the Wind Crest in order to start the climb for the Sky Scroll. The first area will have you use all of the scrolls you've gotten during this quest, the earth scroll to lower some buttons, the water scroll to cross the water, and the fire scroll to turn some braziers on. You'll have to platform your way up to the top of the tower and get the sky scroll after. No enemies, just straight up a platforming puzzle, which can be a bit frustrating if you're not careful enough. After that, you will then get aboard a Thirst Country Empire's floating fortress, so the Fountain. The final dungeon of the game is here. You are then thrown into an area where you'll have to use a sky scroll to traverse around some obstacles. The controls can be a bit hard to get used to, and you'll have to be careful not to hit anything while flying, and also make sure to grab any chest you find lying around. There's also a fun tunnel sequence you have to get through right after that. You then face off with one of the members of Leader Force, Ben. Ben can be a bit annoying because he'll be flying around, you know, dropping some bombs, but once he starts to land, you can wail on him and do a lot of damage. Just rinse and repeat and he's done. Ben also seems to be based on the samurai Benkei, who also stands dying. The second level of Soda Fountain is a puzzle based on the days of the Thirst Puncher calendar. This is a bit of a tedious puzzle, but you'll have to use all of the scrolls at your disposal for you to reach Leader Force member Ed. Ed is a weird boss in my opinion. He does use some sort of magic power as he is able to shoot beams at you. He is pretty straightforward to fight. He teleports around, throws some bombs, and then uses his beam against you. Once he is panting, you can then start attacking him, rinse and repeat, Ed falls down and dies. After defeating Ed, you will now enter an area where you have to basically destroy gates, kill things that block your way, and find an elevator that leads you to the last member of Leader Force. One of the favorite things about this stage is that you can assimilate one of the creatures called Binchloids, and one of them will have the ability Grenade. This is a major lifesaver, as if you have tons of BP to waste, you can easily destroy gates or blockades with two uses. After fighting through hordes of enemies, you then meet up with Topo, the last member of the leader force. Topo's fight is not really a fight per se, but a dance battle. She will challenge you to three dances, and all you have to do is follow the sequence of button inputs she does. I did run into a bit of trouble in this fight since I do have the memory of a goldfish with the dexterity of melted butter. I accidentally hit buttons that aren't supposed to be in the sequence or get faked out by the second dance. Nonetheless, it is a catchy dance dance revolution type of sequence and a palate cleanser from all the combat you had the past few stages. And after you beat her at her own game, Papa will let out a very sussy scream. 
I'll let you guys be the judge of it. You then try to catch up with Capricola, who has the princess with him in the spiral staircase. He gives off those stages at Mega Man X4 or X5 with the spiral staircase backgrounds, and just adds a coolness factor before you face off with the penultimate boss of the game and the crest guardian of the Sky Scroll, the Tower of Death. Huh? Why am I floating? What the? The Sky Scroll activated itself. The design of this boss is kind of cool. Combat-wise, it is a bit of a handful as you are in sky scroll mode, flying up and down as the boss rotates. It has a few set patterns where it will put out obstacles, create electrified barriers, use laser beams, and even do a hexagonal beam move, which does remind me of the terror fields used in Neon Genesis Evangelion. You have to be careful not to get hit by the beams because it will inflict a very annoying status. Reverse controls. The gimmick of this boss is that its core will be rotating around the tower, and you'll have to find it and hit it with Lumina before the core relocates and resets the pattern of the tower. It can be tedious, but the revelations after this boss fight is worth it. And since the Tower of Death is a mouthful, let's just call it Todd. After defeating Todd, you are then treated to a scene where Capricola tells Flatsky that he is not the person who he thinks he is. What are you waiting for? Get my Lumina! Schnell, hurry! Hmm, it must be easy to give orders and complain about everything. What a life you have. Do you know how many lives you've destroyed? Ha! <laughs> As though you'd regret anything. Why'd I even ask? You can't order me around anymore. I've been waiting for this moment ever since. Ever since you killed my parents! What are you saying, Capri? I do not remember killing your parents! Remember this? J John! That hat! You can't be! Good for you. You remembered. That's natural. Even you couldn't forget Thirst Quencher's prince. I've come for revenge. Ah, oh, Deuce Quenches Prince. I thought you died mid your parents. But Capricola, that was an accident. I did not mean to. Huh. An accident? Don't make me laugh. I saw everything. You. You. John, watch out! Uh. Yeehaw! Booza! Hey, Pops, you all right? That's a good boy. Well done. Now I should get the Lumina from that Musashi. Capricola is actually John. John reveals that he was the prince of the empire that Flatsky usurped, and John wants revenge. John and Flatsky pull off the "You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are." Me. John then gets shot by Rutrik, and it's revealed that Flatsky is Rutrik's father. To be honest, I don't even understand how Flatsky can have a German type of accent, while Rutrik has a southern accent. But hey, to each his own. Flatsky then tells Musashi that he has to give up Lumina in order to save the princess. Musashi does so, and Flatsky then releases the Sky Crest, thinking that it would give him unlimited power. However, it turns out that the crests were made to keep the Dark Wizard Lumina sealed, the ancient evil that once tormented the All You Can Eat Kingdom. Flatsky then gets stomped by Dark Lumina, and Dark Lumina will then once again try to destroy everything in his path. At this point, you are put into a chase sequence. You must outrun Dark Lumina as he destroys everything he runs into. This can be a bit tiring as you'll be jumping around a lot and making sure you don't fall or else you get sent back to the start of the chase sequence. 
You can double jump for the most of it, but it is a bit faster doing small hops as double jumping has more animations. And once you outrun Dark Lumina in his first form, you then run into the princess who is in the hands of Kojiro. Kojiro was to challenge you to another duel, but before anything can happen, he gets absorbed by Dark Lumina. Dark Lumina then takes on a Musashi must die type of mentality. You then have to do another chase sequence with some platforming. This chase sequence has to be one of the most unfair and frustrating moments in the game as there is a frame perfect jump you have to make just so you can make it to the other side and start the climb towards the top of Soda Fountain. Once you make the jump, you'll have to start jumping on platforms with the threat of the newly transformed Lumina on your tail. He will jump at certain platforms and those platforms will fall with him. Once you get closer to the top, you will then see the princess lying down. You share a few words with the princess and then jump on the platform that takes you to the final boss fight. Dark Lumina's second form is a bit annoying. You'll have to avoid being grabbed by him as he can slam you on the ground and potentially drop you off the area you're fighting on. Dark Lumina also has a few different attacks such as fireballs. The way to defeat him is to hit the crystal on top of his head with Lumina until it turns bright red. After hitting it a couple of times, Dark Lumina will launch a fireball and then pant right after, prompting the chance to damage his HP. You do this around 4 times. After defeating his second form, you now have to face his final form, Mewtwo. Huh? Or is that Frieza? Are you sure about that? Nonetheless, the game tells you that this is the finale. His final form will fight with elemental moves. He will change in color according to the element he'll be using and also use sword moves since he absorbed Kojiro earlier. You can't damage him by slashing. This time, you'll have to assimilate Dark Lumina and hit his core. You'll have to do this four times. The timing is a bit tough on this one. You'll have to be real fast with the assimilation and also make sure to aim it once before he transforms and prepare to use an element. Once you defeat him, he is then sealed back into Lumina, the Sword of Luminescence. You return back to the castle only to find out that Princess Pele's parents arrive on vacation, ask about what happened, and just get straight up lied to by the princess. Musashi gets back to his world, but not before he seals the sword yet again at the top of the tower, where you get it at the start of the game. I just wish this game offered a lot more aside from an end screen that says perfect. The game is great, but has its flaws. Brave Fencer Musashi is an absolute gem of a game, and if you didn't know, people are speedrunning this game. You can check out a GDQ speedrun of Brave Fencer Musashi. After recording all of the footage I have for this game, I watched one speedrun video and learned of a sequence breaking moment where if you jump into the church, you get into the fight with the Super Vambies Bubbles brought with her. But since I already was in the post game, the game just broke down and froze. It was a fun moment to discover and also a little weird that you can still trigger the Super Vambi event if you jump on top of the church. Another thing that kind of bothers me as well is that what happened to Gingerelle and her sister? Are they dead? Did they die in the destruction of Soda Fountain? Did Rutrik escape? Nonetheless, I had the blast playing this game to 100%. If you made it this far, I totally appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching and sticking with me through Brave Fencer Musashi. If you enjoy these retrospective style videos, a sub and a like would be highly appreciated. I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.